Today for EM and 5 we're going to review mumps and as many of you know this is a viral syndrome usually self-resolving. Um, it's from an RNA virus and the most commonly affected at least before the vaccine came out was mostly with kids. And like most viruses it's spread by respiratory, direct contact, fomites, so basically anyone living in close quarters is very at risk for spreading the disease. Now, this timeline is a little tricky. Exposure, let's say, happens on day one. Now, it can take up to 14 to 18 days for you to actually start experiencing some of the viral syndrome, so fevers, myalgias. Then, the virus tends to go to some organ in the body, so for example, a peritonitis. Those symptoms don't develop for another few days. However, when are you infectious? During a lot of this. So even when the virus starts early, you don't know it's mumps, you think maybe you just have a bad cold. During all of that, there's actually very high viral shedding. In fact, it's three days before a peritonitis would develop that the viral shedding is actually the highest. So that's pretty interesting. And the CDC recommends, based on the viral shedding levels, that you do isolation for up to five days after you develop symptoms of peritonitis because of how high risk the spread is. So like we said, it starts off with a viral syndrome, malaise, myalgia, fever, maybe some headache, and then it spreads to some other organ in the body. The most common would be the parotid glands, so you get a parotitis, which happens in about 90% of people infected with mumps. Um, it's basically an infection of the duct epithelium of the parotid gland, and tend to get painful, swollen, even kind of like a tense swelling um, over the parotid gland in the cheek there. It generally isn't warm, so it shouldn't necessarily feel like a cellulitis, and this swelling can last up to 10 days. Uh, one thing you might notice on labs is an elevated serum amylase, although it's certainly not required to get that to diagnose someone with peritonitis or mumps. Now, especially since the vaccine came out, peritonitis is actually caused more likely by other viruses, so CMV, parainfluenza virus, influenza, Coxsackie, Echo, and even HIV. But because this is becoming more prevalent recently, think about mumps next time you see a kid with peritonitis. Another common location is going to the testes, so you get an orchitis. And here's an ultrasound showing left testy greater than the right, um, so it's more swollen, and that's consistent with an orchitis. Now, this actually happens in 38% of adult males, so again, it's actually pretty common. You get fever, testicular pain, some swelling, um, erythema, and again, you can see here the left side on the ultrasound has an increased blood flow consistent with orchitis. Now, the female equivalent of this, which is oophoritis, is much less common. It's only about 7% of girls. Another thing to look out for is an aseptic meningitis. Now interestingly enough, studies actually showed that up to 50% of people have some virus in the CSF, but it's asymptomatic. So it, it's a very common location for it to go, but it doesn't necessarily cause symptoms. Of the symptomatic population, about 46% have a symptomatic aseptic meningitis. Um, this is mostly self-resolving though. Other things to think about can cause Guillain-Barre, arthritis, pancreatitis, myocarditis. These are much less common. Um, but one thing that you'll note is uh, deafness. This is actually the, or used to be, before the vaccine came out, the number one cause of a sensory neuro unilateral hearing loss. If you do have a pregnant patient who develops mumps, you can reassure them that there are no known birth defects, but in the first trimester, there is an increased risk of miscarriage. Now this is mostly a clinical diagnosis like we said, however, especially in patients that don't have a peritonitis, maybe they have one of the other ones, for example, a meningitis, and you really want to determine what's causing the meningitis, you can get a viral culture from mumps that's either in the saliva, CSF, or urine. Now treatment for this is pretty easy, it's mostly supportive care. It can last up to a couple weeks and have some significant myalgias and just feeling pretty poorly, so make sure you do supportive care, coach people on using NSAIDs and antipyretics and making sure they push PO fluids. Now what about this isolation? I think this is the most important thing to really tell people about. So like we said, the CDC recommends isolation for five days after the start of the symptoms. So not necessarily since the viral syndrome started, but since the peritonitis started. So five days after. This means they need notes to stay home from work or from school. And also if you can, recommend, especially in uh, families, that they try to have the kids uh, you know, sleep or play in a separate room from the other kids. You should also check at this point who else in the family has vaccines that maybe need updating based on their ages. Okay, so let's talk about the MMR vaccine. This is a pretty effective vaccine. It's a live attenuated virus vaccine. And this is the schedule that make sure to ask your patients about. So you should get one shot of MMR between 12 and 18 months. 
the second shot should be around four to six years old. So you should get two as a child and then one to two as an adult. So somewhere after 18 years old, you should be getting another one at a minimum. They recommend two shots if you're considered high risk. So a high risk patient would be people that are in close living quarters, such as dorms in college, or if they're exposed to a healthcare working setting. Now, we said this is a pretty effective vaccine. However, when we've gone back and tested, only about 90% of people have antibody. This is maybe because they didn't get their full set of shots or because it's kind of worn off and as an adult, they need to get that second shot. Now, who should not get the vaccine? If you're pregnant, if you're immunosuppressed or have an advanced cancer, these patients should not be getting the vaccine. So three to remember, you're looking out for viral syndrome followed by some other organ involvement, whether that's peritidis or orchitis. This is a, it's mostly symptomatic treatment. However, make sure you look out for some of those other complications and make sure and coach your patients that they need to have isolation for five days after the symptoms of peritidis, for example, start. And also make sure and check with the rest of the family or their close contacts to see what the vaccine status is. Here are some references and thanks for joining us on EM in 5.